morning, everyone. Uh, we are so glad that you are joining us. Good morning, church. Um, just a recap for those of you who missed last week, we had a summer bash. It was fantastic. We did our outdoor worship service outside, followed by a barbecue and some fun games. And just use it as an opportunity to um, fellowship together, to welcome one another who are a part of the church, and to sort of um, uh, launch this whole season where we're going to really be encouraging us, I'm going to be encouraging you all, we're encouraging each other uh, to engage in hospitality to one another. Um, one of our rules of life is to eat together, and the, the, that's a strange one because the others are bless one another, learn about Christ, listen to the Holy Spirit, and be sent into all the places that we live, work, and play to proclaim the kingdom of God is here. And then there's a, this anomaly one that is eat, eat with each other. And it's, it's kind of strange, but actually in the Bible, over and over again, uh, we are actually told that Jesus came eating and drinking, that one of the primary ways and one of the ways that he overthrew all of the rules and systems and powers of this world was eating and drinking with other people that he wasn't supposed to eat and drink with. And so we believe that part of our call in following Christ is to be the same, to eat with one another. And so we sort of have this thing um, where we, right, we encourage people to practice hospitality through eating with one another, both those inside the congregation and those outside the congregation. So we sort of challenge you, hey, three times per week. So uh, we want you to do that. Uh, so we're going to really be focusing on that over the next couple months from July to September. And we're challenging people like, hey, we really like, we're serious. We want you to eat with one another. Now, if you're like, what about a walk? Does a walk count? And I would say, yes, it counts, but it's hard to put like eat, walk, play. Like, you know, like the whole point of it is that you would engage with one another in an intentional way that you would like take some time, set some time aside, sort of engage with one another, ask questions, listen to one another, host one another, um, show hospitality, show the welcome of Jesus. And so what we're asking from everyone is that you would actually share the stories of hospitality that you're engaging in um, with us. And remember, when we, we do sharing sometimes, and I try to remind people, like, when we're sharing, it's not a, hey, look at me, I'm awesome, I did it. That's not what it's about. It's about, it's not about bragging on you, it's about bragging on what God is doing, right? And so when we silence those things, we think, oh, I'm being humble. What you're actually doing is, like, you're not telling the good news of Jesus. You're not telling the good news of what God has done and is doing in our community. And so we want to share those stories, and so... We're inviting you to share them in two different ways. One is if you want to, if you're like, I'm a writer, like I can type it up. Uh, you can send an email to info at clarksburgchurch.com and let us know about that story. And you don't have to like be like, here are the names, right? This isn't a report. It's not, but like, hey, I met with my neighbor who um, we've met a couple times and we had a great conversation. You don't have to give us all the details of what you talked about, but like, hey, it was great. That's enough. It, ha it can be that short. Or if you want, if you're more of a visual person and you're just like, hey, selfie picture you can take a picture and you can send it to our social media account um uh, we we will not post or share anything without like first getting back to you like if it's a really good picture and we're like hey can we share this on our social media we'll do that first um but one of the things is is we uh i i i don't get to see the full reach and scope of the church right do you get this like the church is not here in this building it's out there where you all go the rest of the week, right? So I get to see the scope of where I go the rest of the week, and I get to see what happens when we're in this space, but I don't get to see the full, you guys don't get to see the full scope of what is happening in the body of believers. And so what we want to do is we want to try to cultivate this picture of like, hey, do you know what Faith's doing? Do you guys know what Jennifer's doing? Like, there are awesome things that are happening, and we need to be encouraged by these amazing things. And so we're trying to create a way for us to share those stories and for us to be excited that this room, this half-filled room, <laughs> isn't all that is happening. That Christ is on the move and the kingdom of God is, is, is bigger than we could ever imagine. So we want to share these stories, okay? So you can email them. You can send pictures. Uh, either way, that's fine. You can, if you want to send pictures via email or send written versus social media, either way is fine. Just whatever is easiest for you, tell us the story, show us the pictures. We want to know what's going on. Okay, uh, in our series, we 
we're in the book of Ephesians, and we have been for, I don't know, months. And, but I, uh, we only have a couple more weeks in Ephesians, but we're deep into the book of Ephesians. And Paul, who is the author of Ephesians, has um, focused the first half of his book, the letter that he wrote to the church in Ephesus, he's essentially talked about, so far, the gospel. He's told the gospel story. He's shared, this is who Christ is, and this is what Christ has done. And because of who Christ is and what Christ has done, this is the family that you've been invited into. It's a united family where your only entry card is that you believe that Christ is who he said he was and did what he said he was going to do. That's your entry card right there. That you can admit, I'm a messed up person and I fully rely on Christ to get me into this family. And that's your entry card. And uh, because of Christ, we are all in this unified family. Now, the second half of the book of Ephesians, there's this shift that comes in everything that Paul is talking about. He starts to give us all these do's and these don'ts about how to live your life, right? We talked about this. We looked at the first part of chapter four, where we looked at chapter four, where he starts to make the shift a couple weeks ago. And so this is kind of chapter five becomes an extension of that. Now, the challenge is that when Paul starts talking about, like, hey, don't do this, don't steal, don't lie, don't sexual immorality, right? Don't, 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 don't. What happens to us in all of our finiteness is that we like to then start to take those behaviors that he has started saying, don't, 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 and we like to codify them to create these new boundary lines of what it means to be a believer in Christ, what it means to be a Christian. We create these new definitions of who is in and who is out, who is good and who is evil. And before we know it, all of a sudden we're back in the Garden of Eden, falling into the exact same temptation that we were, that we did before, where we take what is good, we decide in our own eyes what is good and what is evil apart from God's wisdom. We start to separate all those things. And these passages that Paul uses in the second half of Ephesians and in some of his other writings are off where he's talking about the do's and the don'ts are often used to justify and create sort of these hard lines of who is in and who is out, right? And it sort of becomes, sometimes this passage is weaponized to use uh, and used to circle the wagons of the church community and sort of say like, hey, don't let your kids play with any non-believers. Hey, don't eat with any non-believers. Hey, don't spend time with anybody who's not a part of our church, right? It's used to justify and circle the wagons and build these fences and these walls of like who we can associate with and who we can't associate with. It's focused on creating these really hard edges of who it is that is in and who it is that is out, right? Now, here's the problem with interpreting what Paul is saying in that particular way, like drawing these hard lines to this whole thing. Part of the reason, oh, I was going to do a picture. Should I do a picture? It's a really simple picture. I'm going to put it on this TV, though, and draw on the TV. Somebody's going to hate me for that. But it's poster board, so it won't go through. Okay? Oh, no. Wait. Okay, it's kind of better. Can you even see that? Yes? Okay, good. Let's just, I'm just gonna, uh, if we just keep going, it'll be great. All right, so what we tend to do is we take these do's and we don'ts, and we say, listen, here's Christ, and all the people that can fit into this circle and follow these behavioral codes and live up to these sorts of things, they are in, that's good, and these people over here, they're out. They miss out, they suck, don't associate with them, stay away from them, right? This is what we do in our really, really finite uh, mindset of understanding these different things. Now, here's why this sort of interpretation of what Paul is talking about is a really big problem. There's three. The first way it's a really big problem is because it completely goes against what Jesus did, right? This goes completely against 
what Jesus did. Jesus didn't create these lines of who was in and who was out. In fact, what Jesus did, what actually made people so mad at him, was that all the religious leaders were like, no, 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 we're in, stay in. And he's like, nah, I'm over here, and I'm over here, and I'm eating with these people, and hanging out with these people, right? Jesus constantly destroyed those barriers. He constantly was leaving what was considered acceptable and going out to all of the people who were sick and hurting, all of the people who were broken. Jesus spent time with all of these people. So we can't, it can't be that because Jesus contradicts that. The other problem with this is that like we contradict this. Like, we like to think, part of our sinful nature is we like to draw, like, gerrymandered lines. I used that word the other day, and somebody was like, I don't know what gerrymandered is. Do you guys know that from, like, eighth grade civics class? Okay, okay, so I've got some yeses and some noes. Gerrymandered is essentially this whole thing of, like, what happens in uh, creating zoning law, uh, not zoning laws, um, voting laws, where they try to make the best outcome happen for the people that are still in power. Okay, right? You got this? And so what they do is they draw these lines instead of saying, like, this district will be a voting, this district will be a voting, right? They kind of do this thing of, like, okay, the best outcome is if I could take this group of people and this group of people and this group of people, then I'll get elected, right? So these are the gerrymandered lines. I don't know why they're called that. Was there a guy named gerrymander? I love when we have, like, people who know things. Good job. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Yes. Okay, so they drew these lines to create the best outcome. And we, in our own, like, sinfulness, this is part of, again, the Genesis 3 story where we take the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? We, in our own sinfulness, we like to try to draw these lines so that we're in every time and somebody else we don't like is out. Right? The problem with this is whenever we draw this line, the line goes right through us. Like, there is no way that we can draw. I mean, you would have to get so ridiculous in order to try to draw a line where, like, you are in every time. Right? Because there is some way that you have fallen short of what it is that Christ is calling us to do. Right? That's a part of our admission and entry point into the family of God is admitting, like, I'm really screwed up. I'm really broken. And what we do as sinful people is we like to highlight the places where we're in and somebody else is out. Like, if we're a heterosexual person, we're like, see, I'm, I fit more of what the biblical story is talking about. See, I'm in. And we completely disregard the place where it says, hey, don't be greedy. Well, I mean, that's not that important, is it? <laughs> right? We, we try to draw these lines, and the reality is, is that every time we find ourselves on the wrong side of that line somewhere. And so this also can't be what Paul is talking about. And then Paul continues. Uh, there's another reason why this sort of idea of what is do and don't is not what Paul's actually, this isn't the understanding that Paul had. It actually contradicts what Paul taught us early in his book. What Paul already said was he said, listen, when Jesus came, he tore down the dividing walls of hostility. Remember that part? When Jesus came, he tore down the walls of hostility between those who were near and those who were far. That these walls don't exist anymore. That your inclusion into the family of God has nothing to do with your behavior. And so if there's a hard line of who's in and who's out that's based on behavior, then it wouldn't be grace. It wouldn't be a gift. So it doesn't make any sense to say that Paul is now advocating that you now, now that Jesus has come, now that we've torn down those walls, that we now rebuild them in some way. That doesn't make sense. Paul has spent the first half of his book telling people about the gospel story, that God's decision is to love us in our messed up condition, that he has decided to personally commit to us, and he loves and binds himself to us, that he's going to make a new family that's unified, and he takes up residence with us through his spirit. And that we then, as Paul's talking, enter into this next section where he talks about, like, hey, now I'm going to shore up your identity. Like, that's the do's and don'ts part. Paul's like, I'm going to shore up your identity. You used to be this thing, 
but now you're this new humanity. And so this is what it means to be this. You are holy, you are more loved than you could ever imagine. And because of that, there is, uh, here is how a person with this, that is loved and that is holy, this is how this type of person lives. There's these new parameters for how this new identity is lived out. Listen, we're not going to lie. Not because those who lie are out and those who tell the truth are in. We're not going to lie because you're a new type of creature. You're a new creation. You have a new identity. And what your new identity produces is truth. You don't produce lies. That's not who you are anymore. Instead of being resentful and bitterness and having bitterness, uh, you're going to work towards forgiveness. That, that's who you are. That's your identity. That's the natural fruit that comes from this new humanity that's in you. You're not going to steal. You're going to work so that you have something to give. You're going to let go of language that is, uh, un, uh, that is rotting, and instead you're going to take up the dialect of encouragement. You're going to lay down the idols of sex and greed uh, as if pleasure and wealth are the be-all and end-all that will give you meaning and purpose because they won't. Remember, you're a new type of creature. You're a new creation. You've got a new humanity. That's okay. That's not important. <laughs> it will be in a second. I'll tape it back up in a minute. Yeah, it will. Okay. Uh, you're going to be people. Um, now, now, when Paul starts to tell this, right, he's talking to a group of people, or at least in the Jewish concept, context, a group of people who were bound by like over 600 different types of laws about what they can eat when and what type of fabric they're going to wear and how far they can walk on the Sabbath. Or, or, and many of them grew up, and many of us actually grew up in these legalistic versions of the church where all that was cared about was control and regulation. And what Paul is essentially saying is like, no, 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 you're free. You are free. See, so much of us back then and now were so preoccupied with defining and reinforcing this hard line of who was in and who was out that what we forgot was that what we actually needed to learn was what the heck are we supposed to do with all this freedom? What are, what are we supposed to do now that we're totally reoriented towards Christ? Wait, I have to tape it back up. Hold on. Because I'm going to draw one more line. And I'm thinking in my head, like, is it really worth it to take this time to, to put it up just to draw one more line? And I'm like, yeah, it's probably worth it. I'll keep working on it. But now I have to fill the space, so I'm going to keep talking. Okay, here we go. All right. So Paul's like, listen, stop focusing so much on, like, who's out and who's in, right? Because if you look at the conversations that have happened, that are happening, that continue to happen in the church, so many of them. So many of them are about how do we sure up this line? How do we define this line? How do we, let's create more definition. What does it really mean? Like, right guys? Like, I'm not alone in that. So many of the conversations in the Christian church are about that. And I think what Paul is saying, he's like, guys, stop. Stop. Like, yes, there are parameters of darkness that are out here that will enslave you and, they're, and they'll cause death. So yeah, stay away from those. But I think what Paul is trying to get us to see is like, would you just focus in on Christ for a second? Can we for a second stop trying to define where exactly this definition and this boundary is and instead turn our focus and intention on the center of who Christ is and what he has done for us? Can we begin to sort of learn what does it look like to walk towards Christ in all things? Can, can, we, can we get the center right and let it go of trying to figure out what the hard edge of the boundaries are, right? This reminds me a little bit of like, um, uh, the, uh, if, you think about, um, uh, if you think about a kid who like is in a playground um, and there's a fence around the playground and all they're doing is trying to get out from inside the fence and they're just like screaming, I want to get out of here. And they're like trying to shimmy their body through the links in the fence or whatever. They're trying to climb over and the parent is over there like, no, 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 playground. No, 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 playground, right? I feel like this is what, what we try to do as, 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 as the Western church sometimes right now. It's like all of us are on these edge perimeter lines saying, you can't play in our playground. 
you can't play in our playground. And what we've lost sight of is, well, how do we have fun in the freedom that God has given us? What does it look like to delight in who he is and all the things that he has given us? And, and this is what Paul is shifting to in chapter 5. This is what Paul begins to talk about. He's like, listen, I've already given you the parameters of what leads to death, and now I want to talk about how do we engage in this immense freedom that we have. So I want to start with a story. A number of years ago, um, when my oldest daughter was in kindergarten, she needed to get to school, and the school was about two blocks away. Okay? Uh, my younger daughter was, I don't know, I think she was two from my memory, and we were running late for school, and Zach was in the house, and so I, Harper was playing with something, and so I just told Zach, like, hey, I'm running out of the house, like, I'm going to walk Lyra to kindergarten, and I'll be back in a second. And so I leave the house, and we walk one block, and then we cross, a, like, a fairly busy road, and then we keep walking the two more blocks to get to her school. Um, and I don't think anything of it, and I return, and what I find is that our neighbor has Harper, my two-year-old. And the neighbor is just carrying her, walking up and down the block. And we knew our neighbor, and so she, he knew, he knew who she belonged to. But I was like, Miguel, what are you doing? What are you doing with my kid? <laughs> and he goes, I don't know, I found her wandering outside. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Well, it turns out what had happened is when Harper was perfectly content playing with her toys until she realized that me and Lyra had left the house. And when she heard the door slam, she got up and figured out how to open the door let herself out of the house without Zach ever even knowing, walked down the street to where you cross to get to the, to cross across the road because she knew we had gone to the school. And that is where the neighbor found her, right there, standing on the edge of the street, ready to cross the road to get to where mommy and big sister are, right? Thank God for that neighbor. <laughs> I don't know whether they were just like constantly spot, like doing the dishes and spying out the window. I don't know how it is that he saw her in just the right moment. But as a parent, we want to give our kids as much freedom as we can so that they can enjoy their lives. But there are also parameters. <laughs> there are doors for a reason. Now, sometimes that sounds paradoxical to us of like, how can there be parameters if there's also freedom. We think, well, especially in like America, we talk about freedom as if you can't tell me what to do at all, right? And that's not what freedom is, at least not in the biblical sense. The gospel version of freedom is like, listen, there are things that can lead to ruin, and I want you to be free so you can live free. I don't want you to engage in death. I don't want you to get killed. I don't want you to get kidnapped. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. And so as loving parents and as God, as our loving parent, he's kind of got two roles as we do as parents. Number one is to burn into the brains of those we love how loved they are, how amazing they are, how fearfully and wonderfully made they are, that their identity is secure in Christ, and that there is nothing that they could ever do or not do that would ever lose that, that there is love unfathomable lavished upon them by both us as their parent and their heavenly parent, right? But it's also our job to set up these parameters so that they don't kill themselves, so that at two years old, they don't wander out of the house and try to cross the road and get hit by a car, right? We don't want them to destroy themselves along the way. And when those parameters are set up, oftentimes in immaturity, everything gets focused on this parameter. Well, why won't you let me leave the house? Why can't I cross the street, right? We get up to the fence and we put our face against the fence. Why can't I do this? Why am I not allowed to do that? And what we miss is the freedom that we have within those parameters. Look at all the toys that you have to play with. I have given you an entire house full of amazing things to do. If you want to, like, dump all the Tupperware out of the cabinet, like, go for it, right? If you want to play in the sink and create mountains of bubbles, like, I'm here for it, like, right? Why, why do you want to leave the house? Why do you want to do that, right? You have so much freedom. In some ways, it reminds me of the Lion King. Do you know that, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about right away, right? So Simba, or Mufasa takes Simba and says, you're everything the light touches, right? Is that good? 
everything the light touches. <laughs> right? You can go. That's your land. Be free. Right? I was like, well, what about the darkness over there? What that's the shadow land. Don't go there, right? Uh, it's the same exact thing. That's death. But everything the light touches, that's yours. This is how we stay free. Now, if you think about it, there's huge parts of our days and our lives where we just, like, get to live as these new humans, these, this new type of person. We get to decide what it is we eat. We get to decide, like, like what job we have. We get to decide where we're going to live and what Netflix shows to watch and what hobbies to enjoy and sort of how to book our calendar and what games to download on our phone, right? Like, how to spend our Sunday afternoon. Like, pure freedom. Like, God does not have a thing that says, on Sunday afternoon... You must first, and then you must. Like, he doesn't do that. He's like, no, 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 be free. Be free. And so here's what Paul says to his spiritual children. He's laid out sort of these parameters to protect them, and now he's going to give them words about, like, what does it mean to now be free in Christ, to turn our hearts and our faces and our minds to Christ. All right, so that's what we're going to look at. Now I'm going to take this down. So go ahead and look at uh, chapter 5, verse 15, and we're going to read 15 through 20, and then we're going to go back and we'll, like, kind of parse up the passage and, and see what does this mean for us and how it is that we live this out. Okay, so 15. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And then we're going to keep going. Um, Therefore, do not be foolish, Understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. Now, in this passage, it's kind of funny because it's like all the bumper stickers of like, like what we like to pull out and put on a little like, here's the thing, I made an Instagram picture with a waterfall and be careful how to live, be wise but not unwise, right? So it has all these things and, and at first it seems like they don't connect, but I think Paul is really intentional about how he's choosing his words. He's saying, listen, as you go into the openness and the freedom of your life, You need to know how you're going to make decisions about what it is you do, right? He talks about wisdom. He talks about discerning God's will and being filled with the Spirit, right? So these are the three things he talks about. And he says that when you are focused on those things, when you're using wisdom, when you're discerning the will of God and you're being filled with the Spirit, he's saying that the the outcomes of that are like connected to music and giving thanks and submitting to others. And we're going to, like, the submitting to others part, we're going to couch for next week because that goes into a whole can of worms and it's a sermon on its own. So we're going to couch that one. But he talks about, like, listen, uh, if you're going to follow Jesus into this freedom, you need to have wisdom, you need to be able to discern the will of God, and you need to be able to be, you need to be filled with the Spirit. And when you're doing that, there's going to be some music and there's going to be some giving thanks and there's going to be submitting to others. So we're going to talk about these three, this wisdom, discerning God's will, and being filled with the Spirit. So we'll go back to verse 15. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil, right? Paul is saying here, like, listen, as you go into this freedom, you're going to have to be careful because this is going to get tricky. It's so much easier to sort of define, like, no, N-O-X-X, don't do that, right? It's so much easier to do that, but what Paul is saying, like, listen, as you go into this, like, you're going to need to be careful. You're going to need to pay attention. What you do in your day-to-day life matters. It may seem in that moment insignificant, like you may be like drowning in boredom, but what you do in your day-to-day life matters. How you live matters. And then Paul gives us sort of three contrasting pairs. He says, not this, but this. So the first one is not unwise, but wise. Don't be foolish, but know God's will. Don't get hammered, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, these are the three. He says, don't get drunk, but hammered is just, it's got a little more punch to it, right? Don't get hammered, but be filled with the Spirit, right? Now, these topics don't feel like they are related, but they are. They're absolutely related, okay? Uh, In freedom, 
There are not rules. There's just like, go and be this new type of human being. And he says, first, like, here's the shadow land. Like, don't go there, greed, sex as an idol, bitterness. Those are really going to lead to death and enslavement. Um, so those are some parameters. But now what are you going to do with your life? And so he connects these dots. He says, somehow Paul's definition of what it means to be a wise person has something to do with waking up in the morning and knowing or learning what God's will is for that day. And if you're going to be a person that's able to walk in God's will for the day, you're going to need to learn how to be influenced by the Spirit. Do you guys see that connection there? And there are these behaviors that are going to sabotage your ability to be mature and to steward your freedom correctly. And they're being stupid and getting drunk. Those things are going to set you back. So be careful, right? So Paul says in 15, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Now, when Paul talks about being wise, it doesn't actually have anything to do with being smart or dumb. There are different biblical words that talk about being smart or being dumb. Like that wisdom is kind of its own category. It isn't just knowledge and understanding like you've memorized different verses of the Bible, although that's important. That's not what Paul's talking about when he talks about wisdom. Instead, there is this Old Testament understanding of wisdom that Paul's pulling on. It's this Hebrew word called chokmah. Chokmah. It's chokmah. All right? And it's essentially given to describe artisans and crafts people who were considered wise because they didn't just know about the materials theoretically. They actually could do something with them. Right? So they weren't just a person who, like, knew the compound makeup of clay and sort of how the wheel throwing process works or how you dip the clay like they didn't just watch a youtube video on it they actually have experience of taking the raw material of uh, uh, silicone and all the other particles that make the composition of clay and they know how to take the raw materials and actually complete the process of bringing it into being as something that is useful or beautiful and edifying right that is what wisdom is they had enough practice that they could actually do it. They're able to put it into practice because they practiced. They could take the raw material of something, see its potential, and make it into something awesome. And so what Paul is saying is like, listen, as you engage in this freedom, you have the raw material of your life, where you live, where you work, uh, who you interact with, who you play with, and your ability to be wise is can you take that raw material and make it awesome? Can you take it and turn it into something incredible? Can you make the most out of every opportunity? This is huge. This is huge. There are like entire hours of your life, like days of your life even for some of you, if you're like under 18 and still living at home. There's entire like weeks of your life that are unstructured and are yours to just decide what to do with. And Paul is saying, listen, be wise about how you use it. You have all these raw materials. What are you going to do? Make it awesome. Make something beautiful. Turn your relationships into something, your work, your bills, whatever the things are, your money, your whatever materials you have, turn it into something beautiful. That's what wisdom is. Now, as Christians, we can be really, really stupid, and we can not make the most of it, and Jesus is still committed to us, but you're just not being wise. And Paul is like, Jesus still loves you. He's still given your, his life for you. Um, you have life. Now go for it. Like, go for it. Be wise. Make the most of what it is you're doing. And then Paul continues to the second one. He says, therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what God's will is. Now, if I am wise, I'm sort of cultivating this understanding that as I go through my day, I can make decisions that are more in line with God's will or less in line with God's will. And I may have this idea that God's will, I, many of us have this idea that God's will is this like secret path that we have to like figure out and uncover. Um, that's a part of the Gnostic tradition that is not Christian, and we can go into lots about that later. But uh, that, is, that is not a part of our belief system. 
right? God's will is not this secret path that we can uncover. Like, what is God's job, the job that God has for me in his will? Is it God's will for me to move or not or get married or not? Like, what's God's will? Is this action God's will or against God's will? A lot of times we treat God's will as if it's this point on a map, and then we have to, like, figure out how do I get there. But in Scripture, that's not how God's will is talked about. Um, sometimes God's will is sort of like, hey, listen, stay out of the shadow land. Like, stay out of these perimeters, and, and that's as clear as God's will is. Like, hey, that's not going to be helpful for you. That's going to lead to death. But also, most of the time, it has to do with discerning what's pleasing to God. What's pleasing to God. So, for example, in the story of Harper, my will is don't leave the house without a parent right? Don't leave the house and just wander around without permission. That is part of my will for her. But also, when she's in the house, I'm not, like, going to follow her around and be like, no, not those trucks. I want the red truck. Play with that one, right? Like, I'm not doing that. Instead, my delight for her, my will is for her, is that she would enjoy and thrive and be creative, right? And that's the same with you and I, that God's will is for us to, like, stay in the parameters, but enjoy and love your life. Do what is pleasing to God. Now, how do we know what is pleasing to God? This is where Paul gets into the third contrast. He says in 18, don't get drunk on wine because it leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, we don't use that word debauchery, and, and what it means is, like, without restraint. And Paul here is making a contrast. He's saying, don't be unwise, be wise. Don't be foolish, know the will of God. Don't get drunk, and that's a kind of behavior, because when you get drunk, there's a kind of behavior that is influenced by something that is outside of you. And the contrast is, be filled with the Spirit. That's a different kind of behavior that is influenced by something that is outside of you. Being wise and discerning the will of God all of that requires us to actually think about our lives, to reflect and to sort of plan and be intentional, right? There's huge amounts of intentionality that come with that. And one of the ways to not think about your life is to get drunk. In, flat, in fact, that is like one of the reasons why people drink and get drunk is because they don't want to think about their lives. And in this new humanity, there are, there's this influence. This influence is something you want to avoid, especially because this type of influence impairs your judgment in the moments that you're in. And they will keep you from being able to discern God's will and keep you from being able to be wise. Now, you will not find anywhere in Scripture where it says, like, listen, don't drink. Like, there's no drinking allowed. You won't find a scripture verse that says there's a prohibition of alcohol. In fact, in numerous places, uh, there's, uh, scripture talks about alcohol being something that is beautiful, and it's something that could potentially celebrate life. Like in Psalms 104, there's this uh, psalm where there's a celebration of the harvest, right? And then there's Jesus who turns water into wine at a wedding festival for the purpose of celebration. But there's also many many passages, just as many passages, that while they don't prohibit alcohol, they do warn against the abuses and dangers of alcohol, right? Proverbs 31 is one of them. And it's not surprising that Paul, when Paul talks about alcohol in this context, he's talking about it in terms of like being wise versus being unwise. Now for some people, a bottle of wine is like celebration, like craft beer has its own like culture around it, which I don't understand at all. Um, but uh, for some people, they get together and they are celebrating with some alcohol and it is a celebration. They're thanking Jesus and they're loving one another and it's a beautiful thing. Now for others, it's a decision that is utterly foolish because of alcoholism that runs in their family, because of their, temp their temperament runs towards addictive behaviors, or because they're in a season that's just really tough. And one drink leads to another, leads to another, and could continue to lead to the next. And that's just not a wise decision. And the reason why it's so dangerous is because it's this outside influence that deadens our mind, right? Uh, drinking uh, affects your brain in a lot of different ways, but one of the most important ways that it affects your brain is that it actually impairs uh, your prefrontal lobe. Now, the reason I know this is because um, I have uh, a preteen and a 
teenager, and one of the things that I'm learning all about is that that is something that is still developing, that prefrontal lobe. It's the part of your brain that controls judgment. It helps you think uh, wisely to the consequences of your actions, right? It's the part of your brain uh, that our kids, if you have kids, are still developing. And if you are a, a male under the age of 26, you are also still developing. Did you know that women develop their prefrontal lobes faster than men do? Of course we do, right? Somebody's got to make some decisions about around here. Just kidding. I love you guys. <laughs> it's fine. I just thought that was funny when I was looking at that, right? Um, and what Paul is saying is, listen, if you're a new kind of Christian, if you are centered, oh, and one of the things that it, it, it inhibits is our ability to understand the consequences of our actions, right? So, like, think about a little kid who just threw his truck through a window, right? You turn to that kid, what were you thinking? The truth is, he's not. He didn't have a prefrontal lobe. He's not thinking, if I throw this truck, it's going to break the window, and then it's going to cost $600 to fix it. Like, nobody's thinking that. They're just like, watch this, right? That's what they feel in that moment. And what Paul is saying is, listen, like, you, if you're under the influence of this thing, like, you are not going to be able to make wise decisions. You're not going to be able to discern the will of God in that moment. And if you are a new kind of Christian, if you are centered on Christ, if you're journeying towards him, you have to be free to be that type of person. And so you're going to say no to influences that are going to get in the way of you being that new type of person. And so Paul doesn't say don't drink. What he says is know who you are. Know the situation in life that you are currently in, and don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. Now, on the flip side of this, his contrast is, instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, uh, in Greek, the word is the parakletos. It's the advocate. And while on earth, Jesus said that it was better for him to leave so that the Spirit could come and dwell with us. That the Holy Spirit is Jesus' personal presence that dwells with us and in us. That when people turn towards Jesus, there's this awakening and there's this awareness about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And we become more and more, our ability to be more and more focused on Christ. Now there are times where we are totally uh, filled with the Spirit and oriented towards the Spirit. And then there are, mere there are times where we are less focused on the Spirit, and we realize that we need to be filled. Now, how does this happen? How does the Spirit dwell with us and influence us? I think about this, that the Spirit dwells with us, and I think the best example is Zach and I. We've been married for 15 years, and you can think of your own marriages in this, if you are married. Uh, Zach and I have been married 15 years, and when I look back on who it was before I married Zach, uh, all the ups and downs, I recognize that I am a better person because he's walked with me for 15 years. I can see that. Uh, before I married Zach, I was go, 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 hurry, 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 very little compassion, and I only started crying when I engaged in a relationship with Zach. Before that, I was tough as nails and, like, you couldn't break me. He's broken me. <laughs> that was not meant to sound bad. Like, that was meant to be like, he's made me soft and all of those things, right? He's taught me to be more compassionate, to slow down, to rest, to balance. Now the question is, is that him or is that me? Like, who did that? The reality is, is that we have both grown and changed because of his presence in my life. He has a high degree of influence on my life, but I also allow for him to influence my life. There are some times that he directly calls me out on things and says, why did you do that? Why, why are you being so mean? Slow down. Stop giving us a hundred things that we have to accomplish for today. Right? But I have to make the decision to come under that influence. To sort of submit to that influence and say, you're right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase that to-do list and, and we're going we're gonna to just be with each other today. Now, if not for the presence of Jesus in my life, like, that influence of the Spirit wouldn't have happened. You'd probably, we'd all probably do the best we can, but when it comes to being this new type of person, we need the influence of the Spirit on our lives to help us move into this new type of person that we're being called to be. And then Paul moves into, and we're going to wrap up here, Paul moves into, hey, when you are under the influence of the Spirit, 
when you're filled with the Spirit, there are fruits that come, and he describes them in verse 19. He says, speaking that when we're, under, instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music to your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. Now, this seems totally disconnected, like music and giving thanks, like what does that have to do with being wise? Well, in Hebrew tradition, in Jewish tradition, and even in the early church tradition, the Psalms and the scriptures were sort of the prayer books. They were the song books. They were these passages that allowed Jesus and God to have influence on our lives. They were the way the Spirit moved today. They recited these prayers and these psalms, and they would be sung as a form of meditation. And where the Spirit is alive, we pray with one another, and we sing with one another as sort of this reminder of, of the truth of God and what he's calling us to do. And so for us, what this looks like is like reading scripture, right? That's our song book. We read scripture, and we pray, and then we meet with one another, and we grab coffee together, and we sort of participate in this hospitable communal life and grapple with, hey, how do we live this out? How is the Spirit moving in your life? I was reminded of this thing the other day. And in doing so, we are changed. We're changed. And this is how we walk in our freedom. And here's the thing. I want us as a congregation to be challenged in this. There is a lot of conversation about, well, where are the parameters and where are the borders? And those things, sure, they, we need to have conversations about them. But guys, what I don't hear is a lot of conversations about how do we move towards the Spirit? How do we move towards Christ? How do we walk in the Spirit? Because when the Spirit is with us, all of those ebbs and flows and navigating the tricky situations, like, we'll get there. But let's be wise. Let's discern the will of God. And let's be filled with the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Father God, I am so grateful um, that you have given us freedom. That as we celebrate the freedom that, um, that is iconic in our country, I ask that uh, you would help us turn our minds and our hearts to the freedom that you give us. That you might help us figure out what it means to steward this freedom well, to walk towards you and worship you in all things. Father God, as we sing this next song, would you allow the truth of your word to pour over our hearts? If there's some way that we need to hear your, your, your voice today, your truth today, I ask that you would speak it to us. And we pray all of these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.